These are the opening words of the parable that we have just heard from St. Luke's Gospel. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Take note, both men obeyed the divine commandment to worship in the temple, in the holy place, with God's holy people. The morally upright man and the notorious sinner both belonged there, for they were children of Abraham, and they both needed God. I point this out because in our time it has become easy and fashionable to disregard public worship and to insult church-going Christians as latter-day Pharisees. This abusive language reflects a misunderstanding of the Pharisees, who were themselves quite self-critical. The Pharisee rabbis used to say that there were seven different kinds of Pharisee, and only those who kept the law of Moses out of true love of God were genuine. Remember that Jesus agreed with the Pharisees about the resurrection of the dead and about the necessity of prayer and fasting and almsgiving. There were Pharisees like Nicodemus who believed in Jesus, and certain Pharisees warned Jesus that his life was in danger from Herod. Christ our Savior certainly had more in common with devout Pharisees than with the other Jewish parties of the time, such as the worldly Sadducees and the politically connected Herodians. Keep in mind that the dispute between Christ and the Pharisee leaders was a dispute within the family, within Judaism itself. That is why the word Pharisee ought not to be used among Christians as an insult, for Jesus our Redeemer came to fulfill the law of Moses, not to destroy it. Some people don't bother with the church, because they say there are too many self-righteous people, so-called Pharisees, in the pews. But is there not self-righteousness in such an accusatory attitude? Is there not a prideful sense of one's own superiority in holding aloof from worship and from the community of faith because it's a mixed company? Did the humble tax collector say, I don't go to the temple because there are too many Pharisees there? Others find the Christian emphasis on God's holiness and on sin and redemption gloomy and depressing. Some even say that the church is only for unfree people who cannot think and act responsibly for themselves. Dr. William Sloan Coffin, a prominent Presbyterian minister and social activist, had this to say in response. It is often said that the church is a crutch. Of course it's a crutch. What makes you think you don't limp? You see, the Pharisee and the tax collector both need Christ as their Redeemer. They both belong in each other's company, in the Lord's temple. True humility requires that Pharisee and tax collector worship God together in the way that the Lord has appointed, and that neither of them disdain the other. The Catechism teaches that Humility is the foundation of prayer. As St. Augustine says, man is always a beggar before God. When we realize that we do not know how to pray as we ought, then we are ready to receive the gift of prayer. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector concerns the humility of the heart that prays constantly, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Thus the church prays continually, Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. The Bible tells us in these words of the giving of the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, 
am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The Lord Jesus reaffirmed this commandment when he was tempted by Satan in the desert. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, in him only shall you serve. As the Catechism teaches, God's first call and just demand is that man accept him and worship him. Thus the first commandment contains within itself both a positive precept as well as a prohibition. In essence, God is saying, you shall worship the true and living God in the way that he has commanded, and you shall not worship strange gods. Let us then accept in faith our Savior's words, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. St. Peter proclaimed to all Israel that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven besides the name of Jesus given among men by which we must be saved. The gospel of redemption solely through the precious blood of Christ crucified is and always has been a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. We cannot compromise on the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. We are his, and he is ours. According to the Catechism, the duty of offering God genuine worship concerns man both individually and socially. This is the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies toward the true religion and the one Church of Christ. The Catechism urges Christians to treat with love, prudence, and patience those who are in error or ignorance with regard to the faith. That is why the state must practice tolerance and protect the religious freedom of all people as they seek the truth, with due respect for the public order and the common good. The state may legitimately recognize an official church or religion, but should also respect the freedom of religious minorities, because faith cannot be forced on anyone. As baptized believers, we are to make good use of religious freedom by bearing witness to the grace and truth of Christ that we have received, and by sharing our faith with others. As the Apostle writes to the Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. St. Peter tells us, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Let us pray that at the end of our lives, each of us will be able to say these words of St. Paul to Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith.